Hi, good morning, Vinewood. Uh, welcome to our Sunday service today. Um, if you guys could either stand or show your videos, that'd be great. Um, and this is our last service before we start inviting people to come in, so hopefully we can see you guys all soon. But like for now, please uh, show your cameras um, and well, we can worship together.
Okay, everyone, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are um, unwavering hope, Father, in this time. 
Uh, we thank you that, um, yeah, you are all we need. Um, uh, as we um, can see the light at the end of the tunnel of this quarantine, Father, we um, we thank you that you have plans to prosper us, Father, and um, to grow us. Uh, that your plans are perfect. Um, yeah, and we pray that as we continue to go through this sermon series, you would teach us um, to to not value things of this world, Father, to look to Jesus, Father, look to um, our home in heaven, Father. And, and um, yeah, we thank you so much that we have um, a kingdom, Father, waiting for us. I pray for Dennis as he uh, comes to speak. You would bless his words that we'd be um, receptive to um, your teaching. Um, thank you so much for this time. Uh, we can gather uh, and worship um, our living King. Um, in Jesus' name I pray. Uh, hello, everyone. Sorry for the uh, technical interruption. Um, so I'm Handong Ling. I am uh, one of the adult leaders for Crossroads, our college ministry. Um, and I'll be doing announcements today. Um, our first announcement is uh, uh, getting connected. So uh, we want to just welcome all our newcomers in this time. We'd love to get connected with you better. Um, if you want to fill out the Get Connected Google form on our website, um, which will also be linked in chat, uh, please feel free to do that. Um, also, uh, if you have time afterwards, we are having Zoom breakout rooms for you to uh, get to know everyone and just introduce yourself. So stay afterwards for that. Uh, the next announcement is uh, next week, uh, we will be changing uh, our service time um, from 9.40 to 9.30. Um, so this is starting next Sunday, April 18th. Uh, this is just to accommodate for our Sunday service team members who will be uh, training to help with the reopening and for the transition between English and Chinese service, uh, just to give them more time to, to clean and to uh, make sure everything's safe. Uh, our next announcement is uh, Vinewood is hosting Baptism classes starting next Sunday, uh, April 18th at 11 a.m. on Zoom. Uh, these are four classes uh, which are going to be taught by Uncle Richard or Pastor Chris um, in preparation for our baptism service on Sunday, uh, May 16th. So if you're interested uh, in getting baptized or just curious about uh, what that might mean, uh, please contact um, fellowship leaders, um, Chris, Dennis, yeah, anyone about baptism. Uh, next uh, is we have prayer meeting. Uh, so prayer meeting uh, is weekly at 12.30 p.m. If you're interested in joining, there's a link on our uh, website um, on the home page. Uh, this is a time for congregation members to pray for each other, the world, uh, our church. Um, so we hope to see you there. Uh, lastly, if you have offering this morning, we encourage you to give online via Zelle or PayPal. Um, information can be found on the Give tab of our website. Um, now I'd like to uh, hand the mic over to Pastor Dennis for our sermon series. Good morning. Uh, we are returning back to the book of Hebrew, uh, not Hebrew, sorry, Matthew this morning. Uh, we've been studying the book of Hebrews. All right. Uh, am I good? <clears throat> We're returning to the book of Matthew this morning. Uh, pretty excited. We've been on a break for a while, about two months, and so it's good to be back. And I just kind of maybe give us a recap of of Matthew, because we've been on and off for a while. I, I feel like ever since Advent, we've been on and off. So uh, let me kind of just, for those who may be new or just to kind of refresh, a recap, uh, he, the book of Matthew has been, we've been going through this book of Matthew, and we've seen this theme that's been woven through this narrative in Matthew, which highlights and accentuates Jesus Christ as king. And, the, and Matthew's goal is for his readers to see these prophecies found in the Old Testament being fulfilled through this Messiah that we've been eagerly waiting for. And this Messiah is Jesus Christ himself. He is what we call the one true king, the king that everyone has been waiting for. And throughout this book, Jesus has been ushering his kingdom that defies all expectations of the people. He is not the king that they are wanted but he is the king they needed. 
And many theologians describe Matthew's kingdom theology as this upside-down kingdom. And so we've been using this illustration to explain what that looks like. And if many of us, if we've watched that movie, or not movie, the series Stranger Things, we are actually the ones living in that upside down, this really dark, demonic, messed up world that reflects the real world, but much darker and much more evil and cruel. And Jesus has come to actually turn that around, the one true king, turning our kingdoms upside down so we can live right side up. And so since it's been a while since we've been in Matthew, uh, this is a quick recap, kind of like previously on The One True King. In chapters 1 through 4, we've seen the birth story, arrival, and the coronation of Jesus uh, through his baptism. We see his vic victory over Satan uh, over, uh, in his temptation in the wilderness. And he starts beginning to preach this kingdom message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We see the beginning of Jesus' ministry at the end of chapter 4. Uh, chapter 5 through 7 is the very famous Sermon on the Mount, the first discourse, a chunk of Jesus' teaching about what his kingdom is about. Chapter 8 through 9, we have nine stories of ten healings. These ten people being healed by Jesus, and we see that this Messiah has authority and power of all creation. This king has an authority that's beyond just this earthly realm. Chapter 10 introduces the 12 disciples, He's, these 12 followers of Jesus, and includes a second discourse, a second summary of Jesus' teachings, more teachings from Jesus. And then chapter 11 and 12, we are introduced to these negative responses and controversies from the leaders. Uh, we even have Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, wondering if Jesus is this promised Messiah. In the beginning of chapter 11, uh, we find that John the Baptist is in prison and he sends uh, this message to Jesus asking, hey, are you the one we should be waiting for or should we be expecting someone else? After all, John the Baptist has been, he came and he was preaching about this Messiah that was going to come, the axe that is laid to the root of the tree. He was waiting for Jesus as Messiah to bring justice. And here we find Jesus uh, bringing, instead of bringing justice, he's bringing healing and healing in the most random places, like in the boonies. And John himself is imprisoned. And so Jesus, they expected Jesus, he expected Jesus to be doing ministry and bringing justice in this big and gigantic, miraculous way. But instead, Jesus seems to need a strategist. All right, even your Instagram influencer will say, Jesus, you're doing it all wrong. If you're trying to gather a crowd and have people follow you, you're doing it in the worst way. You're saying controversial statements that drive people away. Strike one. You're not addressing the political nature of the government and oppression known as Rome. Strike two. And instead, you're taking off the most influential religious leaders of the day that everybody looks up to. Strike three. And here, we are left at the end of chapter 11. Jesus is now comparing these cities that he's reaching out, he's doing all these healings, to pagan evil cities of the past and comparing these cities saying, you're worse than them. This is almost akin if, we would, if someone would say, remember the Third Reich and Nazi Germany? If Nazi Germany would have ever heard the gospel that you've heard and even seen anything that you have seen, they have, would have repented. But you haven't. I mean, you're going, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's kind of, you're taking it pretty far here. And that, that is exactly what Jesus is doing. He's taking the most evil cities and evil places that they would know of in their history and saying, you're far worse off than them. And so that's not very endearing or winsome, if you ask me. And then by the end of chapter 11, Jesus now speaks of this person, the one who would give rest for the soul. And those who come to him will find true and eternal rest. And this is where we pick up on the subject of Sabbath and what it means. And in this passage, we'll see that Jesus proclaims that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. And in this passage, Jesus makes this bold proclamation to the, despi uh, to the demise of the Pharisees when he's saying that I am the Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, he says, I, I made the laws, I get to interpret the laws. And what is the Sabbath? Or what is the kind of main idea, the big picture that we want to see this morning as we go through this passage? 
Sabbath is a gift that draws attention to the Lord who brings true rest. Sabbath is a gift that draws attention to the Lord who brings true rest. So let's go ahead, and if you have your Bible, we are in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, and we will be from verse 1 through verse 8 this morning. So if you're taking notes or you want to jot this down, you may repeat again. This morning we're going to see Sabbath is a gift that draws attention to the Lord who brings true rest. Would you read along with me or follow along with me as I read, as we pick up in chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they looked at it. They looked to him, or they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. What is going on here? At the end of chapter 11, we're reminded, Jesus uh, says, and Matthew leaves us with this phrase, Come to me, all who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The question on the minds of the readers is, how does Jesus give rest? Why is he able to do this? And in the next section, Matthew intentionally brings up the topic of Sabbath, and we're here to see what Jesus is saying, to follow what Jesus is saying. In verse 1, we see that it is the Sabbath day, and for them it is Saturday. That is the Sabbath. And Jesus and his disciples and the Pharisees, they're walking and heading towards the synagogue. And as they're walking towards the synagogue, they're in a grain field, and the disciples, it says, we see, being hungry, they start plucking the grains and eating it. The Pharisees notice this immediately, and they comment on this action. See, the thing is, it isn't the plucking of someone else's grain that gets them in trouble. It, it's not even the eating and plucking that gets them in trouble. Uh, Leviticus tells us that the people are to leave the corners of their field untouched so the people can go, uh, the poor can go through it and eat. So that's not the problem. It's not like they're stealing anything. The problem is when they are doing it. They are doing it on the Sabbath day. And they, in the minds of the Pharisees, they're going, you are breaking the fourth commandment. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11 tells us what the fourth commandment is. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall, do, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So the question on the minds of the people at that time was, what does it mean to remember the Sabbath day? How do we follow this commandment? And there was no easy answer for them. Because for the most part, Scripture seems very vague on practical application points of the Sabbath. So the religious leaders took great pains to try to set that up. Because the people are wondering, well, how do I keep the law? What does Sabbath mean? What does work mean? And what does rest mean? And so they had many rules to follow as they continued to figure out all the, you know, the, the religious leaders as they've been working generations upon generations, trying to figure out what this is. And they made many rules, and with those rules came many exceptions. It became really increasingly difficult to know what is Sabbath keeping and Sabbath breaking because there was rules and exceptions. The first thing I thought of when I was researching and like kind of studying and, and just learning all these things, I thought of the English language. So many rules. He has so many exceptions. And I can see why it's so hard for people to learn it. I digress. And here there's all these rules to follow. And all these exceptions to remember. So let me give you a few examples of what that looks like. As they try to figure out for themselves, for their people, how do I keep the Sabbath? So for example, they said you can only travel 3,000 feet from your house. About .57 miles which is an acceptable length for Sabbath keeping. If you walk only that much around your house, 
uh, kind of that, that, that radius, you're good. You're not working. But if you have food within your 3,000 feet of your house, you can travel an additional 3,000 feet because that is an extension of your house. Because of course, right? That is my sandwich. Now I get to walk another half mile, right? Like, well, it's kind of weird, but like, that's, that's how they see it. Okay, okay, all right, all right. Wear a jacket on the Sabbath, and you're okay. Take off that jacket and carry it. Now you're working, right? Try, good luck trying to keep the Sabbath in SF. Unless you can claim that coffee shop about half a mile from your house as an extension of your house, maybe you can walk back home and pick up a jacket at night when it gets cold. No baths. Because if water splashes on the floor, it will, quote, unquote, wash the floor, and that's work. I feel like whoever made these rules never did house chores. You know what I'm saying? Like, who in the world washes their floor by taking a bath and splashing it on the floor? I'm like, what are you, kids? Right? Like, who does these things? How would you even equate that as, as work? But here it is. That's what they're doing. The Sabbath it's actually supposed to be a gift for his people. It's like mandatory shutdown for a lot of these companies that, you might, uh, that you've heard of, right? It's like mandatory shutdown, like you have to take PD, PTO or we're just not going to have anybody come to work. All right, imagine if one of the family rules in your household is that everyone must go on vacation once a year. That sounds like a great law, a great rule, right? Every year. We must go on vacation. We have to go to the beach. No work, no cooking, no cleaning, nothing. We are going to go, and we're going to lay on the beach, and we're going to have fun for a week. That is the family rule. Everyone's going to be like, that's a great rule, right? Like, I love it. Right? The parents are like, I'm paying for the trip, but we're all going every year. No cooking, no cleaning, no working. Go out, relax, enjoy your time. But imagine if you start overthinking these questions, which is what they were doing. What would they start asking questions if that was the rule in your house and, you're, and you go, and go, hmm, but what is really cooking, right? Like, if you're telling me no cooking, what does really cooking mean? Maybe we should define cooking as taking ingredients and combining them together for a meal. That sounds like a good, that's a, that sounds like a good description of cooking, so we can't do that. And then the next thing you know, you get in trouble for breaking the vacation rule because you squeeze ketchup and mustard on your hot dog. You're combining ingredients that must be cooking, right? I, I might be, I, I, might, I want to say I'm being facetious, but that's kind of what's happening here. They're gathering, they said gathering grain, work. How do you gather grain? You must pluck the grain. And so as these disciples are walking through and plucking grain to eat them, they're like, ah, oh, you're plucking grain. That must be work. And trying to apply, the thing is, trying to apply this law, what it means to keep the Sabbath, apart from understanding who God is, would just, they just completely miss it. They're trying to apply laws from God without understanding the purpose of the law. And the, the Pharisees are completely detaching themselves from understanding the purpose of the law, understanding who God is, and that actually detaches them from the goodness of the law. They might think they're obeying God's law, but they do not understand the heart of God's law. And because of that, they're missing out on all the good parts of obedience. They're trying to apply the law without understanding the purpose of the law. And they miss out on the goodness of the law. Church, right, when, when it comes to faithfulness, obedience, and trusting Christ, I, I want to ask us this question. Like, have we detached, trying to apply the truths, these truths in our lives from the truth giver. Right? So many times I hear and even feel for myself. Right? Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. I just want to know what to do. Just tell me what to do and I will do it. Pastor, tell me what to do in the sermon and I'll just do it. I just need practical application. Now, there is nothing wrong with practical application. There's nothing wrong with practical application. I love practical application because it's so practical. It's so easy. But when we jump to the what to do and skip the why we do it, we miss the good stuff. We miss the good stuff. We miss the relationship aspect. And we're prone to misunderstand and misapply, just like the Pharisees. 
because we don't understand the character and intentions of the one behind the command. And here the Pharisees, they completely miss what the Sabbath is about, right? End of verse, uh, end, end of chapter 11, Jesus is telling them what the Sabbath is about. It's a rest for your souls. And here, in the beginning of chapter 12, the Pharisees are like, it's just these things that you have to keep, these very petty laws that we're just going to kind of build up. They're missing the point. And Jesus, is, and Jesus says, it seems like you don't understand, so let me, let me try to explain this to you, Pharisees. And verse 3 says this, he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of, pre of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how the Sabbath, the priest in the temple, profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? And Jesus, um, and Jesus here, he's, he's, he, starts, he starts by, by he, he, starts this, he starts this verse, or just when Jesus responds to what the Pharisees says, it's pretty savage. It is pretty, it's really savage because he openly says, he starts questioning the Bible knowledge of these Pharisees when he says, have you not read? Right, this is not, and he starts bringing up these, um, he starts bringing up these topics, this, these narratives that are not like these intricate, minute details. These are everyday things. Like people, like the Pharisees, if you studied scripture, you would have known these things. These are simple stuff. And he starts by saying it like that, which would be like very piercing for the Pharisees to hear. It's like going to a Chinese restaurant and your server gives your whole party chopsticks, he looks at you and go, do you want a fork? Right? Like, and he's like, literally, that's kind of how he's doing. He's like, have you not read? I mean, I, you, you say you're Bible teachers, but have you read this? Just, just wondering. Just curious. Have you even read your Bible? Right? Like, bro, do you lift? And so Jesus says this, and then he gives this example. The first one we find of King David in 1 Samuel chapter 21. And this story, David is the anointed king. He's the anointed king from the prophet Samuel. So, in, in, so God says, you are the king. But in the political sense, he is an illegitimate king vying for the throne of what they would say the legitimate king is, which is King Saul. It's very Game of Thrones, right? Like, and, but, but here we have King David, God's anointed king, and then King Saul, the, the, the king that was reigning, the quote-unquote legitimate king politically, he, King Saul is trying to kill David. David is running until he can actually get the kingdom. And so here, David and his men, they're running from King Saul because King Saul is trying to kill them because he's trying to take his throne. And they, place, they, they end up in this place called Nob where the, the high priest called Ahimelech is, is there. And so David, he's been running and he he gets here, and, he, and his men are exhausted, and they're hungry. They, go, they come to Ahimelech, and they ask if he has any food. And he says, all I have is holy bread, which is the bread of the presence. And he goes, if you're, you and your men are holy, you can have it, but they, they obviously are not. And what this bread of the presence is, what, what they have to do, this is kind of the background that for us that we might not be well versed in, in in this type of background, is the bread of the presence, there are actually 12 loaves of bread that they have in the tabernacle, and it's on this gold table. And so they'll bake this fresh 12 loaves of bread, and they'll put on the 12th table, and it'll stay there the whole week from Sabbath to Sabbath. And this fresh bread is supposed to symbolize the 12 tribes of Israel and their need for God's fellowship. Like, this is Israel's need to have fellowship with God. So every Sabbath, They'll have this hot, fresh bread. They'll place it on this table, and they'll take the weak old bread, and they'll take it off the table, and that is for the priest to eat. So the priest gets to eat that bread, and it's for their sustenance, and it's for their provision. And so that was the bread that David was like, hey, do you have any food to eat? He goes, we have this bread. We have this weak old bread that's only for the priest that represents this, this it was a symbolism of God's mercy for his people. And so Ahimelech gives this bread to David and his men. Which seems like, it seems like straight up breaking the law. But Jesus' point is, Ahimelech understood 
that symbolisms and rituals can never trump necessities and act of mercy. Right? And so Jesus is going, clearly, at this point, like the symbolic nature, what's the point of the symbolic gesture of mercy, which is the representation of bread, if you can't even, if you don't actually enact mercy itself? And so this is what happens, right? Ahimelech gives this bread to David to eat. And if David is allowed by a priest to violate the symbolism for a real act of mercy, then Jesus' disciples are surely allowed to violate these man-made traditions that are not even spoken of in Scripture that hinders and not helps God's people truly understand the meaning of Sabbath. So what Jesus is saying is, in very simple terms, Sabbath rest doesn't mean resting from mercy. It doesn't mean from resting from mercy. And next week, we're going to see that in a very pointed example about this. So I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind because Jesus is going to return to that point and really hammer it, hammer it in. And so Jesus is going, it's clear, your man-made traditions are prohibiting real acts of mercy being done, and they're not even found in Scripture. So why would you even think that this would be a Sabbath honoring when you won't even, when this doesn't even reflect closely to what the Sabbath is about? And then Jesus says, let me give you another example. Let me give an example, this time from the Torah or the law. All right, if you're all about the law, let me give you an example from the law, one that's actually found in Scripture. And essentially, Jesus, he makes this point, right? This priest, these priests, they do temple work. And they do temple work on the Sabbath. They're actually working on the Sabbath. They're doing these things. And he uses the word profane the Sabbath, not in a, not in a literal sense, but kind of like, quote, unquote, like, look, they're, quote, unquote, profaning the Sabbath because they're working. And you're okay with that because you recognize that in this, that, yeah, they, they, this is what they should be doing. And so, he's, and Jesus makes a simple point that the priests in the temple, they don't rest on the Sabbath. They are working. They're doing sacrifices and all these other priestly works that come with it, right? On Sunday is a work day for me. I'm a pastor. I preach on, on Sundays, and this is a work day for me. And Jesus says, for these priests, this is a work day for them. And you understand. He's like, hey, Pharisees, you understand the difference. You understand that there's a difference here. Because Sabbath rest doesn't mean you rest from worship. You don't rest from worship. And so Jesus is defining and teaching what true Sabbath rest is. He's making it very clear. Embedded in Sabbath rest is this rhythm of mercy and worship. These are not areas you rest from. And those are areas you don't take a break from. Those actions of rest, those are actions of rest, not of work. You're missing the point of the Sabbath if you're getting people to not do these things. And the Pharisees are completely missing the point. I mean, they kind of understand the point of the, the priest thing because they're letting them work. But Jesus is going, it's clear that within the rhythms of Sabbath, there is this quote unquote work involved. And so I want to ask us this question. When we maybe think about things like the Sabbath and think about it specifically, I would say specifically about Sabbath. And when we start asking ourselves, well, what does it look like for us to rest? Do we compartmentalize our lives so much that when we take a break from life, we take a break from faith? Now, I want us to think about that as well, right? When we take a break from life, do we take a break from faith? Like rest mode and work mode has two different sets of priorities and values. All right, what does it look like for us to live out mercy and worship out of rest in Christ? All right, are we seeing that as like, oh, I just have to work and do, 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 like serving and this and that? Is it, is it like, oh, it feels so hard. It feels like work, right? Church feels like work. Sunday morning feels like work. Worshiping feels like work. Uh, small groups feel like work or helping people out and doing all these things. Acts of mercy feels like work and sometimes I need a break. Like, do we ever kind of separate those two and start thinking of all this as work and needing a break from instead of seeing what does Sabbath rest look like in the rhythm of acts of mercy, in the rhythm of worship? Because all of this talk about Sabbath rest is actually supposed to draw our attention to the giver of rest, who's Christ. 
So what does it look like for us who receive this rest into our everyday, li- everyday lives? Like, how does that manifest out for us? And then Jesus, he draws the attention, right, when speaking of the Sabbath rest, after he's, like, teaching them what it is about, what it's not about, how you're messing things up, Pharisees, right? You don't understand what's going on. Let me teach you what's going on. Let me kind of give you an example and show you what Sabbath rest is. He then points to himself, right, who is the giver of this rest. And this rest was spoken, and this, this very rest that was spoken of the chapter before. So if you pick up with me from verse 6, he says this, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. The guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Verse 6, Jesus says this, right? He goes, he goes I tell you something greater or someone greater than the temple is here. Jesus is talking about himself right here. But before we can understand why this phrase was so important, we got to understand why the temple is important and what it represented. So here's the deal. The temple is where the presence of the Lord resided. Right? It started with the tabernacle, the, the, the thing that they would carry around in the wilderness, and that's where the Lord's presence resided. And eventually, uh, King Solomon was able to build a temple, like a permanent resting place for the Lord, and that is where the Lord resided, dwelt among his people. This wasn't just a building, but this is literally where God rested on earth. The temple was a reminder of what once was. You see, there was another place where the Lord resided and his presence was with his people. That place was the Garden of Eden. So all that we have here is echoing the creation narrative and, is, uh, and it is a foretaste and a foreshadow of redemption narrative. The Lord created the world in six days and rested on the Sabbath. And he was with his creation, with humans, made in his image, Adam and Eve. And it was there the promise of eternal Sabbath rest was given to Adam and Eve that was ultimately ruined by the fall. So the temple represents in a dwelling place of God, giving them a foretaste and a foreshadow of an eternal dwelling place of God, a reminder of what once was the garden and what will come, the better heavens, the new heavens and the new earth. The priest represented of a people dwelling before the presence of God, reminding them of what once was Adam and Eve, the first you can say people who dwelt amongst the presence of God in a foreshadow, a foretaste of what will come, a people dwelling in the presence of the God of God forever. And here we see continually, right, the Sabbath points to a time and a place where there was this Sabbath rest, a, a, a people resting in the presence of God, working out of that rest, and what's to come, a people that will dwell eternally in the rest of God. And all of this is kind of going back and forth. The temple, the priest, the Sabbath, pointing back to a time and a place that was where, where all was right. And so this temple, the priest, the sacrifice, it also reminds the people of what went wrong, of sin and rebellion. The temple and the priest and the sab reminding people what's needed for forgiveness, shed blood, right? People will come to the temple to give their sacrifices, a reminder of what separated them and what's required for that separation to be mended and reconciled. And what we truly long for, a true Sabbath rest, reconciliation between us and God. It is a foretaste of a new heavens and a new earth. All of this, the temple, the priests, the Sabbath, are all garden rhythms to remind us of of a redemption that is coming. Of what once was, what was ruined, and what is 
to come. So when Jesus says something greater than the temple is here, the Pharisees are probably going, what can possibly be better than the temple? That is where the Lord resides. That is where Yahweh is. His presence is there. Well, the thing is the temple is temporary. Christ is saying, I am here. I am the redemption you have been waiting for. The way to return to the better garden, to bring about the better perfect sacrifice, to usher in a truer Sabbath rest. I am the better temple. I am the Messiah, the one you've been waiting for. And Jesus then quotes Hosea 6, 6, correcting them of their faulty understanding of Sabbath. It's like, you have missed the point. You do not understand. And then, boom, right? Let me give you the correct interpretation of the Sabbath because it is me coming to bring true rest and reconciliation, right? I am the Lord of the Sabbath. This is not a physical, petty thing you're trying to do here. You see, Jesus is not trying to abolish any laws, He's not trying to change any laws. He's not providing an alternative. He is saying that the point of the Sabbath is for you to be reminded of the true and eternal rest you need. That is the point. That within your rhythm, there is this garden rhythm to remind you of what was and what is to come. And here I am. What is to come? I am here. I am the fulfillment of the Sabbath. I am here to bring you true rest. And this rest is what our souls long for. The rest of the better garden, the rest of the presence of our God, our Heavenly Father and Creator. This can only be achieved through Jesus Christ. You see, King Jesus, he is the better David, who is the bread of life. Instead of asking for bread to sustain himself, he is the one who gives bread to sustain us eternally. He comes to sustain and satisfy our weary souls and hearts. Jesus here is the better priest and the better sacrifice. He is the one who pleads on behalf of his people upon a blood not shed by bulls and goats, but his own blood, the better blood, the better sacrifice. And through his life and sacrifice, the sin and rebellion of his people are forgiven and atoned for. He is the better priest. He is the better sacrifice. Jesus is the better temple. Where in him we reside in the presence of God, known by God, loved by God, finding our rest in God. Scripture tells us, that is, by grace, through faith, in Christ, we are saved. We are given this true Sabbath rest. If we put our trust in his perfect life as a substitute for our rebellious life, when we put our hope in his penalty-absorbing death as a sacrifice and payment on behalf of our sins, and if our faith is in Christ's resurrection from the dead, it is also for our own spiritual and physical resurrection as well. We too have this rest that is promised. Rest in a new life in Christ. A new hope not found in this world. A garden rhythm that reminds us that the best is yet to come. That is our Sabbath rest. Our Lord of the Sabbath. This is who Jesus is, and Jesus, this is who I am. What I bring, the gift that draws our attention to King Jesus, who brings true rest. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, we come to you, many of us, maybe with weary, heavy souls, laden with burdens of trying to apply your law without knowing who you are, driven to morality, driven towards trying to be a good person, or driven trying to maybe contribute something to life and society without understanding who you really are. I pray that we find rest for our souls in you. 
that we see that you are the better king. You are the better priest. You are the better temple. You are the better sacrifice. You are the Lord of the Sabbath. May we come to you with humble hearts and receive the true rest that you offer. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Well, let's all come together for a time of response. It's not my
Pray with me. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for worship this week. Next week, we will start our reopening phase. So I look forward to having a small section of you here. We're so thankful. Uh, can't wait to see everybody back. Uh, but until then, have a very blessed week. Uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Love you. Bye.